Welcome to Friends in Fiction, five best-selling authors and the stories. Novelists Mary Kay Andrews, Kristen Harmel, Christy Woodson Harvey, Patty Callahan Henry, and Mary Alice Monroe are five longtime friends with more than 80 published books to their credit. In 2020, they created Friends in Fiction to provide author interviews and fascinating insider talks about publishing and writing, and to highlight independent bookstores. These friends discuss the books they've written, the books they're reading now, and the art of storytelling. If you love books and you're curious about the writing world, you're in the right place. Hi, everyone, and thank you for joining us on this Sunday. Oh, it's so funny with just the three of us. Look I at know. us. <laughs> so big. Thanks. Woo! <laughs> Thanks for joining us on a Sunday for a special behind the book episode of Friends in Fiction. I'm Christy Woodson Harvey, and I'll be your host. I'm Patty Callahan. I'm Mary Kay Andrews. And this is Friends in Fiction. It's Today not, we, we don't get our names mixed up when it's just the three. When of it's us. just the three of us, right? There's no <laughs> awkward pause of like, wait, who's next alphabetically? We really, y'all, we nailed this. Go but, us. That was our best introduction in 80 episodes. I'm really yeah. proud of us. And today we are so excited to be talking to a good friend of all of ours, Susan Boyer, the USA Today bestselling author of the Liz Talbot series and founder of a group I'm sure a lot of you know, the incredibly popular Facebook group, Low Country Book Club. And you all know that supporting independent booksellers is the beating heart of what we do. It's what we said we would do when we founded Friends in Fiction. And this week we are supporting a favorite of all of ours, we all visit them every time we have a book out, and that's Foxtail Bookshop in charming Woodstock, Georgia. They have created a one-stop shop landing page for all of our new releases, including Susan's and our Wednesday night guest this past week, Vanessa Riley. The link will be available on our Facebook page. But for now, we're so excited to welcome our charming guest, Susan Boyer. Susan M. Boyer, we'll ask her what the M stands for. Magnificent? Yeah. Marvelous? 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 Yeah, marmalade? I, I don't know. Magnolia? Millicent? Maleficent? No. <laughs> Susan is the author of the USA Today bestselling Liz Talbot mystery series. She was blessed with a quintessential small town girlhood and has had a lifelong affair with books. She's grateful to have been gifted with an overactive imagination. She was one of those children whose teachers were always telling her mama she needed her talents to be channeled. I wonder if her teacher stopped, told her to stop visiting with her neighbors. <laughs> anyway, Susan's been making things up and writing them down her whole life. Her debut novel, Low Country Boyle, won the 2012 or 2012 Agatha Award for Best First Novel. That's really impressive. That's kind yeah, of amazing. The is. Daphne du Maurier Award for Excellence in Mystery and Suspense and several other award nominations. The third book in this series, Low Country Boneyard, was a killer spring 2015 Southern Independent Booksellers Award okra pick wow. and was shortlisted for the 2016 Pat Conroy Beach Music Mystery Prize. Mm -hmm. Low Country Book Club was a summer 2016 Seba Okra pick and was shortlisted for the Southern Book Prize in Mystery and Detective Fiction. That is just a lot of amazing awards. That yeah, well, and especially, you know, when you think about 
having a series that has right, I mean, we're going to talk to her about this, but it's just, it's amazing to really think about, you know, that kind of longevity in a series and all those amazing awards. There are currently 10 books in the Liz Talbot series. Liz Talbot and Nate Andrews will have a new case that we're going to be talking mm -hmm. to Susan about soon. Susan loves beaches. Uh, she's currently at Polly's Island. Southern food and small Southern towns where everyone knows everyone and everyone has crazy relatives. You'll find all of the above in her novels. She lives in North Carolina with her husband and spends every second she can on the Carolina coast. I thought she lived in South Carolina. We're going to have to talk about this situation. <laughs> Let's talk about this. Oh, no, she moved back to North Carolina, I think. All right. At any rate, we'll ask her. Sean, bring Susan on. <laughs> Hi, Susan. <laughs> hello, hello. So North Carolina or South Carolina, clear it up. Okay, so it's South Car it, it was South Carolina for 30 some odd years. Okay, because you were in, in Greenville. Yeah, yeah okay. I was in Greenville and, and Mount Pleasant for a while. Okay. Uh, but we lived in South Carolina for a long time. I've lived in South Carolina longer than North Carolina. Okay. But um, we recently moved back to Rowan County yep. because, uh, to yeah, to be closer to my parents. Yep. So. That's so great. And what so a great place to live. I'm going to talk about this a yeah. little bit later, but Susan and I are both from Rowan County which is oh, wow. so crazy okay. and really fun. It's a small, small world. <laughs> it is a small world. Well, Susan, we are so thrilled to have you here and thank you for joining us tonight. Oh, thank you for having me. Susan, we are so happy you're here. I think the last time I saw you was doing the book club. So it's yeah. happy that, to flip the tables on you. Yes. Um, <laughs> we have all been guests of yours at the past in the Low Country Book Club and you have created one of the kindest, most supportive, corners of the internet. Before you tell us about the idea for the Low Country Book Club, what does the M stand for? Yes. <laughs> Michelle. It's my middle name. Okay. <laughs> not my middle okay. <laughs> name. My middle name, I must say. <laughs> That's awesome. So tell us about your idea. Like how, what was the origin of the Low Country Book Club? How did it get started? You know, I'm, I'm a little embarrassed to say this because it was it was an accident. Um, I, you know, I started out with a group of uh, of readers who, who enjoyed my books and we talked about my books and it was just my little corner to be there with them and, and be accessible to them. And it, it started growing. And, you know, after we got through talking about my books, I mean, we were all reading a lot more books and there was just nothing else to say about the, the current release that I had. And so mm -hmm. I started talking about what I was reading and then they started talking about what they were reading. And suddenly we were talking about all of your books and, and other folks' books and books that we all loved. And, and there was just this commonality of, of what everybody liked to read. And so I changed the name of the group from, Liz Talbot's book club to Low Country Book Club. And we just kept on doing what we were doing, talking about um, ap about the books that we loved. And it was very organic because people just joined. Um, you know, they, they told a friend or, or whatever. And one day I just woke up and there were more than 10,000 people in there. And I'm like, how did this happen? That's yeah. awesome. <laughs> so it was an yeah. accident, but a, a happy accident. I love it. I have so much fun with it. And having well, all of you, of course. I, I, and I think that's a little bit what happened to us, right? There's, yeah. you know, when you go, when you start to gather readers, they're just mm -hmm. community just builds on community and builds that's on community. Right. Um, so if the Facebook gods are correct, you started the group in 2018. So yeah. it is a very active, for those of you out there, it is a very active book club. How do you keep things, maybe it's a selfish question, how do you keep things so fresh and keep people coming back day after day and then balance your own writing with managing this active group? So advice and how are you doing it? Tell we us. really brought you on today to, <laughs> yeah. to tell us what to do. We're just going to steal your brain for a little tiny bit. You know, I, I have help. And, and, you know, I, I couldn't possibly do it all myself. Um, I, I spend time in that group every day chatting with people and commenting and responding and, and that kind of thing. But, um, and, and, and I post there every day, but I have help with, you know, graphics and things like that, like most folks do. And I have help um, managing and monitoring the group because otherwise I would never have time to write and, you know, 
I, I have to do that, of course. So I, I have help. I mean, it's, I could never spread myself that thin. So we were wondering if you had a twin who you kept locked <laughs> up and then they did yeah. the work. So no, I have an assistant. Her name's Marianne and she's awesome. I don't think she ever sleeps, but I, I do not have a clone. I wish I did. I Can could we have her number or twins. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Hey, Susan, speaking of writing, I was just blown away that the 10th Liz Talbot book in the series, Low Country Boughs of Holly, released in December. When you began that series, Liz Talbot, did you foresee it lasting this long? I really planned for it to be a series. I, and in the beginning, I wanted to write one series and, that, and I just wanted to write a bunch of books because I love long series. I love mm -hmm. getting invested in characters and the characters sort of becoming your friend that you want to revisit. And I love reading those things that I can go back and, and visit the same characters over and over again. And they're like old friends. And so right. I really yeah. did. I, I wanted to write a series that was just one series that I wrote a bunch of books in. Now I have a few other ideas, but I still want to write Liz and Nate because I enjoy them. Could you tell us a little bit about the publishing path for the first one in the series? Oh, wow. That was, rough. was Low Country um, Boyle, right? <laughs> yeah, Low, Low Country Boyle was the first one. That was that was interesting. It was it was a rough path. You know, I, I, I had been working for a, a, a ladies apparel company and um, and it went out of business. And my husband and I decided I could give the writing thing a go. And so I'd, I started working on that book and it took me a long time to get it polished, you know, to where I felt like I could submit it. And then, you know, that was submitting it to agents. And, and when I first started submitting that book to agents, uh, most of them were still paper queries. So we were typing letters and mailing them with the self-addressed stamp envelope still. No, so I remember that was fun. That was fun. I did that uh, same thing. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Did you? I, yes. I would have thought. It and was, it was in like 20. 11 2012 yeah. i mean yeah. it wasn't that long ago it was like sh not i mean i would think that it would have been all email at that point and i remember yeah. having new letterhead made and i was like for sure if i get really nice letterhead and i spend a lot of money on it i'll get an agent and i did like like because then i wouldn't need it you know so i had all this letterhead right. that like i didn't need so that was that's my tip <laughs> and going to kinko's do you remember we would go yeah. to kinko's and yes. our staples <laughs> The and print it. it out. Yes. Yeah. I remember like going the to the box. post office. Yes. With, yeah. yeah. Mm -hmm. Now so, you just go. Quit. Sorry, Susan. Yeah. No, no, that's okay. So, <laughs> so she was, uh, I finally found an, an agent. She was, no, the, the, yeah, the first one was going out on submission and, um, she went on sick leave and didn't come back. And so they moved Whoops. me to a different agent and he had, uh, editorial contacts with folks that did like, um, I don't know, urban fantasy and things like that. So not the same stuff. And, you know, eventually I just, I, I was just, I was so ready to have this book out in the world. And uh, I, I knew of a small press that was uh, just starting up. And I thought this will be a good idea. I sent it to the editor. She loved it. And so the agent sort of talked to her and he, he worked me through the contract and all that. But then we, we sort of parted ways soon after that. And, um, and so I, I went with a small boutique publisher for mysteries for the first book and then just ended up uh, being with them for a while and actually just have wrapped up uh, the, the 10 books that I will do with that publisher. Ah. Um, you know, in a series like this one, that's been what, 10 years, you've built a really loyal following. And I, and I've, I've been in that place too. I did a eight, I did an eight book series and I know those readers have a lot of opinions about um, your protagonist Liz's choices. How much do you listen to them when you're deciding what's happening in her life next? You know, I try to keep them in mind. I try to think about what do my readers want? I mean, I, I mean, of course I have my own ideas, but I try not to stray too far from what I think they want because I want them to be happy. I want them to, keep coming sure. back for more Liz. So I just, I try to think, you know, what do they want? What is the book that they want? And especially with the most recent one, Bows of Holly, I used to, I, I thought about that a lot. You know, what is it my readers want? Because I knew they wanted a Christmas book with Liz and I just tried to give them what I thought they wanted. And, and, you know, that's, that's all I guess you can really do is try, but I just try to keep them in mind. 
I love that. Well, um, I have a short series that's just three books, but I have a Christmas book coming out in October. And um, I started to feel this huge pressure because I wrote it because people wanted more of the series. And then right. I started to feel like, oh my gosh, what if this isn't the book they want? And what if, and the book was yeah. already written. And of course I knew the story I wanted to tell or I would never have, wouldn't have just written a book just to write it. Um, but I actually went on Facebook one day and was like, what do you want to make sure you see in Christmas and Peachtree Bluff? Because I thought, what if there's like some secondary character that I don't really think is unimportant, but they all love or, you know, what if, um, and anyway, my editor laughed so hard at that. She was like writing by committee, like such a good idea. That's definitely <laughs> what you should do. But you know, when you have a series like that, that people are really invested in, you do want to give them, I mean, obviously it's your story and you're telling what right. you want to tell and advancing it in the way you want to. But I think it's so funny that they're like these little things, like there was a dog in the series and, um, we had sort of killed the dog off and people were like, we want to know what Biscuit's up to. And I was like, oh God, like Biscuit's dead. We better, we <laughs> better have, bring Biscuit back. Do we have back. a Biscuit funeral? Do we have a Biscuit funeral in Beachtree? <laughs> well, we just made it work. I just that made it little, work. Little Will, little Will was like, I, I don't think you should kill off Biscuit. We discussed <laughs> it and he was like, I, <laughs> rest in peace Biscuit. It's like, I think Biscuit really needs to, you know, still be in there. So uh, anyway, well, I do have a question in there somewhere, though. Um, so while your novels are technically mysteries, you weave a lot of really great family dynamics and settings into them. And in fact, I said this already, but, you know, you did grow up in the South. We grew up in the same county, which is so fun. So how do you think your Southern upbringing influenced your writing? Oh, well, if at all. I I think it totally influenced it because just the way that I think, you know, the, the way that that words come to my brain and just the way that I, I the way I think it, it, it's just it's completely Southern. Everything's completely Southern. The um, the things my mother put on the table, the things she said, the, the things my grandmother said, you know, just I don't know. You guys know. I mean, everything that is the South, you're sort of like steeped in it. You're sort of marinated in it. And so what comes out of you is just the same. You know, it, it, it sort of yeah. manifests itself in what you and what you write, because that's just who you are. You sort of answered this, but I don't know if there's anything specific you can think of, but do your real life experiences ever make their way into your fiction, do you think? Well, some of them do, actually, um, especially the ones that are family related. Now, I, I always say I, I don't write about real people, and I don't, but, but there are glimmers of my parents, especially, that sort of make their way into these books and Liz's parents' characters, things that my dad does. I mean, I don't make him the character, you know, Frank Talbot, but I, I do take things that he's done and weave them into uh, the story, and I have a lot of fun with that. He'll never know. He doesn't read novels, but my mom gets a big kick out of it. So um, in that sense, I've used things that have happened to me. I've never met a killer that I know of, um, but I, I've always enjoyed mysteries. I, I grew up wanting to be Nancy Drew. That was my very first career yeah. goal. My parents frowned on that. But um, anyway, I, I, I do use things that are sort of minor things like um, uh, a slice of life things and, and recipes and, you know, things that mom cooks and things that might have happened at church or whatever. I, I use those things, but the, the mysteries themselves, all oh, that's made up of whole cloth. None of that is anywhere close to true. It's so good to know. <laughs> when, when you first started the series, right, in the very beginning, I have a couple questions about it. I want to know about the name Liz Talbot. We were joking about your middle name, but which goes along with the question, did you know you were going to be living with her for all of these books? So why did you name her Liz Talbot? And then um, did you know that this would keep going and going? Was it, did you mean for it to be a series? Um, I, I did mean for it to be a series. Um, Liz Talbot, I chose that name because I've always liked the name Liz. I, I don't know why. I just like the name. And Liz Talbot is sort of my avatar. You know, I sort of live vicariously through her. It's like playing a video game. I make her do okay. the things that I think I should. I let her do fun things I'd like to do. I'd love to live, uh, you know, have a beachfront house. So she has one because I think that yeah. would be fun. So I sort of made her my like, 
perfect version of me in this alternate universe who's younger and thinner and, and all that, um, and better, better hair, better skin, better, you know, but, um, yeah, but Talbot's that last name I took uh, right off the clothing store because I love it. <laughs> I was that wondering. Time, I, was, why I, asked. I was wondering. I was curious. I love that. Oh. That's awesome. <laughs> I, I bought so many clothes there, and so I I, I just loved it, and I so I, I stole it. That was the, and just like the church on Sullivan's Island, I stole the name Stella Morris off that church for my island. Yeah. Um, you know. So yeah, I, I swipe things. Um, there's a great book called, um, oh, I'm going to blank on the real title, but it's something about that the best artists steal, that you take wow. things and then you make them your own. So it's not really stealing. So you, you didn't exactly. steal it. You, no. you took it and there's nothing new in the world. So that's how you started. But where do you suggest or recommend your readers start? A new reader who's coming to the series, where do you think they should start? always at the beginning with Low Country Boyle, okay. um, just because the characters' lives uh, unfold throughout the series now. Okay. The mysteries, the books are, are self-contained mysteries. There's a self-contained mystery in every book. So you're not gonna be lost as far as clues and, and, and the mystery and that kind of thing. But Liz and Nate, their story unfolds, you know, and, and everyone okay. else and the it, sort of the townspeople you know, her family, her friends, all of that, their lives unfold over the course of the series. And so I think readers would be missing out if they started in the middle, although some tell me they have and they were fine. Um, I think they'll be happier if they start at the beginning. Okay. Do you have more from Liz? I do plan to write more Liz. Um, okay. And it's interesting because I, I, I started uh, the, the next Liz book and then partway through, I decided that this uh, particular book needed a different detective. And I, I've had this other detective sort of in my mind for a while. And so oh. I started playing with something new and, and, and so I'm working on something this new. This is so exciting. Uh, oh, yeah. oh. <laughs> so that's what's next for you. Okay. Um, so there will be more Liz, but there's also a new detective coming. Uh, and okay. then I have a women's fiction novel in my head that I've been playing with for years and I keep saying I'm gonna write, but um, I don't know, I keep gravitating back to the mysteries. And so I think it's like the new mystery and then Liz and then the, the women's fiction book, which is loosely based on like 87 things that happened to me in one year. and. I give them to like different characters because no one will believe all these things happen to one person. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Susan, one of the questions, most popular questions we are always asked wherever we go, where do you get your inspiration? Where you know, I get it come from, from, from everywhere. It could just be the tiniest thing that somebody says and it pops into my head. And, and especially with the mysteries, I just, I have this overactive imagination and I start thinking, what if, you know, like, like normal people see things in, in a certain way, you know, they, and, and th they'll drive by a couple stop by the side of the road uh, and they'll think, um, I hope they have a cell phone. I hope triple A's on the way or, or whatever. And I think, he's going to kill her and drag her off in the woods. It's going to be on the news tomorrow. They're never going to find her body because that's just the way my head works. So just that's how Mary Kay's head works too. Yeah. <laughs> really? Really? This, this I think is a part of a Southern upbringing. It's everything is a oh. catastrophe. Oh, like, yes. <laughs> it's not There's just a flat drama. tire. It's not just a flat no. tire. No. <laughs> Oh, I oh love God. that. Well, your overactive imagination has served us all very well. So thank you for that. Um, and Susan, we have a lot of writers on this page. And since um, you obviously have had an incredibly successful career and many, many more great ideas to come, do you have a killer writing tip that you'd be willing to share with us? Well, I'm certain I don't have anything that you all haven't already thought of, but I will share this because, uh, and something Patty just said, maybe think of it, uh, when you you take things that, that happen and you, or, or you take it and you make it your own, um, I, I, I do this shamelessly all the time, things that people say, and I used to have trouble remembering them, you know, because things would just pop into my head and I wanted to write it down, but I'm like doing something where I can't like, you know, write it down or whatever. And so 
what I've started doing is keeping notes like the notes app in my iPhone um, and, and it's on my desktop. And so like I have one for snippets of conversation that I overhear for, for words that I just like that somebody uses that I think, Oh, I like that word. I want to use that word, you know, um, or if a story idea pops in my head, I put it all in notes and then they show up on my desktop when I open my computer. And then I remember, Oh, I wanted to do something with this or I wanted to do something with that. And I don't lose, lose as much as I used to lose uh, just by using notes, which I have my phone with me nearly all the time. So it's fairly easy to just either type it or dictate it. And then I can go back and retrieve it and I'm losing less. <laughs> we, oh, we just lost Christy for a second. I'm sure she'll pop back on. So I, one of my favorite books on writing is Bird by Bird by Anne Lamott. It is such a great book. And in there, she's always talking about always have a notepad and a pencil with you because you never know. And of course, when she wrote that, she didn't know that we'd always have this, right? Right. right. And so I, I, I was driving today and um, I pulled over and put some, did audio in some notes mm -hmm. because I thought of something. So I didn't even need a notebook. So I, I love that tip because we always think, oh, we're definitely going to remember that. Yeah. And I, never do. <laughs> I, always, I always think I'll remember and I never do, but I didn't realize that you could have, I mean, this is really dumb and I'm literally seeing it right here. I had no idea that the notes from your phone could just go straight to your desktop like that. Yep. So that's figure that helpful. Out. So, so you are wrong, Susan. That is definitely something that, um, <laughs> yeah. that really Thanks. helped me. I don't know about everybody else, but we really ask for yeah. the writing tip for us. We don't, it's selfish, so we don't care. I know it. we don't. We don't. <laughs> <laughs> oh, and along with writing tips, we're always looking to add to our to be read piles. And I think one of our favorite things about doing friends and fiction is that we have found books we wouldn't have found otherwise. We've read books we wouldn't have read otherwise. So, what are you reading and loving lately? Okay, so I just finished um, The One You're With by Lauren K. Denton, which I really loved. I love um, Lauren. Oh, She's I awesome. love her too. She's awesome. Yeah. yeah. I, I love that book. She just does family so well. And that's she actually the so first well. book of hers that I've read. But oh, she wow. just did the relationship so well. And I'm thinking now I want to go back and read everything that she's written. So I'm looking forward to that. Um, I just also finished, um, oh, what's the, the book everybody's talking about? Um, the last thing he told me and you know, and I should know better because in the beginning it tells you there's a heartbreaking ending and, and it is a great book, but, but there's a heartbreaking ending. I knew that going in and then I was disappointed that there was a heartbreaking ending because I, I like books in happy. So yeah. and it, it was a great book, but, yeah. and everyone's reading it apparently, but I've told them that when I was reading Ellen Hildebrand's 28 summers, you know, you know, you going into it, it's going to be a heartbreaking ending. And so I got, there were like two chapters left and I just had to put it away for a little while because I was like, I'm not emotionally prepared. I know what's coming. But like I can't handle it right now. So I'm just going to have to wait. And so I waited like four days before I read the last two chapters. And I was like, okay, you've got this. You can do it. Go. Mary Kay, you talk a lot about, about happy endings versus heartbreaking endings. Mm -hmm. And you think about that when you're writing, don't you? Yeah. I'm, that's what I'm aiming toward. Um, like Susan, yeah. Sometimes, you know, sometimes um, it isn't the happy ending readers anticipate, but yeah. I, um, that's a gift I want to give them. That's sort of my unspoken promise with my readers. I'm a I big fan that. of a happy ending too. Yeah. And, and sometimes like every now and then, you know, I'll get a review that said like, this ending was so predictable. And I want to be like, I would love to have read this review if it wasn't. Like if that thing didn't happen, <laughs> I would love to have read the review then because that would yep. have been a really horrible, horrible, mean book. <laughs> Why did Biscuit have to die? <laughs> Why did Biscuit, Biscuit, Biscuit have to die? die? <laughs> dog <laughs> killer. <laughs> oh, no. It wasn't like the dog like got run over on page or anything. It just it just had happened earlier, but not anymore. <laughs> This is alive. <laughs> dog color. Biscuit has been resurrected. <laughs> oh my gosh. Okay, you guys. Okay. 
So, so he's going to be okay. The dog. I'm just. Biscuit's going to be okay. There's. Okay. There, there is I'm here no. To tell you, Biscuit lives. <laughs> now people are going to be like, "Where is the scene where the the dramatic rush to the vet scene? None of that happens. It's just Biscuit wasn't in the book, and now he is, and that's it. There's okay. no that's dramatic simple. Biscuit storyline. Right. He that's is simple. in Christmas at Peachtree Bluff. So, you know, that, that he's there. Mm -hmm. I, I get that too, though. Uh, readers will ask, Liz has a dog, Rhett, a mm -hmm. golden yeah. retriever. And, and readers will ask about the dog. And, mm -hmm. and what I have found is that I cannot leave Rhett alone too long or, or readers will say, you know, Rhett, really? you know, I feel bad for Rhett. He's, he's been alone too long. So I have to be very careful to make sure that Liz has plenty of time in her schedule to get back home and, and take care of Rhett. And if she hasn't, because she's in Charleston for a stakeout or whatever, then mm -hmm. I have to make sure that her sister's going by to take care oh of the dog. Gosh. Oh my gosh. Yeah. She's like oh, solving yeah. a murder, but it needs to get home yeah. and feeding. Someone time. has to, yep. Someone That's has to take care of the dog. That's oh amazing. Gosh. Well, <laughs> zombie biscuit. <laughs> okay. So now it's time for our lightning round. Lightning round. Woo! <laughs> um, but Susan, you don't really have to answer these quickly. You can, okay. you can make them as fast or slow as you would like. They're just a little bit shorter questions. So mine is who would you invite to your fantasy dinner party? Oh, wow. Um, oh, that's hard. You it know, is hard. I, that is hard. I, 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 fantasy. You know what? Honestly, right now, for a variety of reasons, I, I, my husband, just, just the two of us. Aww. That's my fantasy love, right now. I love that. That's awesome. I've never, <laughs> ever heard anyone say that to that it's question. It's adorable. I love that. I love it. Nobody has ever said they wanted to invite my husband to their dinner fantasy <laughs> party. <laughs> or me. He's fun. For me. Um, For me. Okay, here's a good one, Susan. If you could give one piece of advice to your younger self, what would it be? Oh, be patient. You know, just mm. be patient. <laughs> mm -hmm. Just take your time and, and, and just be patient. Just don't try to do everything right now. Just take a breath. <sighs> Go slowly. <laughs> don't rush into mm. things. Mm -hmm. I would. Yeah. That's a good one. If you had a one year all expenses paid trip to anywhere in the world, where would you go? Oh, St. John. I mm, love St. John okay. in the Virgin Islands. That's just my, that's my happy mm -hmm. place. I, I love every beach and, and I love the South Carolina coast, of course, mm -hmm. but, um, but if somebody's know, paying for it, yeah. Yeah, yeah. St. John, it's going to be St. I'm John. a big Virgin <laughs> Islands fan too. I would come visit you, Susan. <laughs> That's we should retreat. do this. We should do this. <laughs> writer's that. retreat. We got to find someone to pay for the all yeah. expenses paid. But other than that, we're good. Yeah. I'm trying to ask this woman a lightning round. <laughs> I'm so chatty. Sorry. Sorry. I know. Hey, Susan, if you weren't a writer, what would your dream career be? Oh, gosh. I can't think of anything else I would like to. Well, okay. If I, if I, I would work in a bookstore, it would be something with books ah, I because that. I just love books. If I, if I, I couldn't that. write, I would have to be in a bookstore. Love that. You write about the low country, obviously. Do you have any other settings you have dreamed of writing about or exploring in your work? Honestly, this is a boring answer, but no. Um, <laughs> I just, I love the low country. We, we lived in Mount Pleasant for a while and, and it, where we were, I could like ride my bike to Sullivan's Island and ride my bike down the beach and come home. And I did that virtually every day after I dropped the kids off at school. And I just love that. And we ended up moving back to Greenville and it's a long story, but I just, I love the low country. That's my, that's my happy place. That's a great answer. I love that answer. Well, Susan, thank you so much. Stick around for another minute because, because we have one more question for you before you go, but we have a couple of announcements. We wanted to remind everybody out there about a few things. Um, first of all, if you haven't heard, Friends in Fiction has partnered with Oxford Exchange to offer exclusive Friends in Fiction merchandise. We have adorable soft t-shirts, wine sippies, and coffee tumblers, and some really amazing products on the way. Also, we wanted to remind you that supporting indie booksellers is one way to keep communities up and running. This week, Foxtail Bookshop, as we already mentioned, is our featured store, and they are offering all of our books in one convenient link, link for easy shopping. And don't forget, 
we have a podcast and it isn't just the shows. We have an every Friday podcast. We've partnered with librarian Ron Block. And so we're so clever, or Cap Mary Kay is so clever. It is called Writer's Block Podcast with mm -hmm. Ron Block. And we have had the most fascinating people on and we have a brand new episode every single Friday. This coming Friday, he talks to Virginia Willis, right? That's her yes. yes, yes, about her new book. So we're really excited. And usually one of us is on there, if not yeah. more than one. So yes. it's Ron. We plus, do it with him. Yeah. It's Ron, Ron plus, plus a bonus, plus a bonus uh, author. Um, yeah. And did you know that Patty, Mary Kay, and I all have winter books releasing? We have partnered with our friends at Nantucket Book Partners to create a special winter wonderland subscription box where you will receive all our new releases as they release plus a special exclusive Friends in Fiction mug and hot chocolate. So visit Nantucket Book Partners for more information. And we will also have that information available on our Facebook page. All right, Susan, you're up one more time before we you go. We have a question we love to ask all of our guests. And that is, what were the values around reading and writing in your household when you were growing up? Oh, wow. Well, my mother read to me from the time I was... I can't even remember. I was I was way young when she started reading to me. So reading was always part of our lives. Uh, she was just a voracious reader herself. She read to me. I, I always watched her with a book in her hand. So I was reading at a very early age and was just craving books because that's what she did and because she read to me so much. So we were readers always. That's, that's awesome. awesome. Jinx. Uh, well, thank you so much for joining us, Susan. Um, we thank have so me. enjoyed. Thank you for interrupting your vacation yes. to be yeah. with us. We really appreciate it. And to everyone out there, do not forget, you know, it's Christmas in July and we're all talking about Christmas books. So don't forget to pick up Susan's latest, Low Country Bows of Holly. Or if you haven't started this wonderful series yet, start at the very beginning with Low Country Boil. Thank you, Susan. Thank, Thank you so much for having season. me. This has been so much fun. It's, it's great to, to see, see all of you. you. you and do. everybody go to the Low Country Book Club. Oh, you'll love it. Out. It's yeah. so great. It's a great it's little so great. corner of the internet. Mm -hmm. yes. It is. It is. Um, and thanks to all of you. Thanks, ladies. That was so much fun. I loved being with you guys. That was um, awesome. She's so interesting. The way yeah. she started that series, kept with the Low Country, and then built a whole book club around it. It's yeah. awesome. It's so cool. It's amazing. And 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 it sounds like she has a lot of great new things coming out. So yeah. Yeah. I love that. And I love a series. I'm very, especially now, I don't know what it is, but I just am really into things where like I can just go right back into that world where yeah. I've already been. It's yep. and you already know the characters. Yeah, there's something really comforting about that. And I think we need that right now. So yep, definitely. anyway. I mean, people all right, come ladies. to you all the time, Mary Kay, don't they? And tell her mm -hmm. you missed the Callahan. Yeah. I mean, yeah. probably because of the name, but they missed the Callahan mm -hmm. series. Well, and I hear them all the time say they want another Wheezy and BB book. Yes. Yeah. Constantly. Are you going to write another Wheezy and BB? Like, I see that everywhere. All right, ladies. Well, y'all are the greatest. And all of you out there, y'all are really the greatest. Thanks so much for joining us tonight and every night for this special behind the book episode of Friends in Fiction. We will see you Wednesday night live at 7 p.m. right here with Lauren Willig. See you then. Good night. Good night. Good night. Thank you for tuning in. Join us every week on Facebook or YouTube, where our live show airs every Wednesday night at 7 p.m. Eastern Time. And please subscribe to our podcast and follow us on Instagram. We're so glad you're here. Good night.